If you guys love Bad Day HQ, don't forget to check out Good Day HQ, available at youtube.com slash gooddayhq. It features the best in reality television, travel shows, and just general fun stuff to bring a smile to your day. Among the ancient Norse gods stands the figure of Loki, a trickster. According to myth, one of Loki's deceptions caused the death of a god. He was punished for his deceit. Some say that when disaster strikes without warning, it is Loki deceiving his victims, blinding them to danger, getting even for his punishment from the gods. In 1939 Australia, Loki's deception traps hundreds of unsuspecting people in a disaster of historic proportions. Australia, the land down under, is known for its many exotic animals, koalas, kangaroos, and wallabies. Visitors to the country find an astounding variety of landscapes, from rainforests and fertile croplands to snowfields and deserts. Australia's southernmost state is Victoria, an area rich in natural resources and rugged beauty. More than 30% of the state of Victoria is covered by forest. Much of this forest consists of the eucalyptus tree, sometimes called mountain ash. Australian eucalypt forests have been reliant on fire for survival for millions of years. They have a eucalyptus uh, oil, and in, in intense fire, the eucalyptus oil can move into a gaseous form and ignite, and it's just like an explosion. In the 1930s, the state of Victoria is a haven for pioneers who work in a mostly rural economy. Well, Victoria in the 1930s, I think, would be a, a very different place to what it is today. Wheat farming, sawmilling, um, dairying, all those sorts of indust industries would have been predominant. People, I think, were, were different in those days too, in terms of their attitudes. People were happy with far fewer things. Living in a remote section of bush in the southwestern part of the state, the Robinsons are a hard-working farm family. John and Mary Robinson have nine children, ranging in age from 18 years to six months. Oh, our family lived in the very deep heart of the bush where very little transport and no good roads. John Robinson, and he was born in Ireland and, and he's a Royal Marine, he's pretty proud of that he was. And then my mother, Mary, she was born in Ireland too. 200 kilometres east of the Robinson farm, William and Maggie Hunt live with their 15-year-old daughter, Margaret, and Maggie's brother, Ted Scott. My dad worked out because we only had a 35 acre farm. I just stayed on the farm with my mother and of a weekend I liked sport. I played tennis and went around to dances and that sort of thing. For those who call the Australian bush home, the threat of fire is a constant. At least in terms of recorded history, uh, particularly from the mid 1800s onwards, Every five to six years, a major fire would rip through the Victorian bush. For Australians, December 1938 and January 1939 are typical months, hot and dry. These conditions, along with poor fire prevention, lead to a severe fire hazard. By Monday, January 9th, 1939, a growing number of fires are burning throughout the Australian bush. The 1939 fires, it wasn't a fire, it was a, it was a series of fires. There was something like um, close to 500 individual fires across the state. The fairly meagre firefighting resources that were available were pretty exhausting. Um, hundreds and hundreds of people from Melbourne and the regional centres were being called up to try and help. But in effect, we had an exhausted firefighting force 
On January 10th, 11th, and 12th, unusually hot weather continues to fuel the tenuous situation. We had a week of very, very hot temperatures, probably about 114 degrees, winds of about 100, 100 uh, miles per hour in certain places, and relative humidity as low as 8%. And what really happened was that the fires that had been burning for weeks, but had built up on the, on the 10th, 11th and 12th, actually started to join. And that's, that's probably the very, very worst scenario that you could actually uh, see. The sweltering hot morning of January 13th finds the Robinson family at home. And our mother, she always had prayers, they always said prayers every morning. And the girls just went and said they'd do the washing and my dad was and brother were up the bush chopping wood. And they came home because they felt it was a dangerous day. Elsewhere in the state, Jack Jones delivers livestock to market. Afterwards, he boards a bus driven by his friend, Charlie Sims. They are destined for Apollo Bay, a popular vacation spot. Everybody seemed to be good-hearted. They were going for a holiday, most of them. I think some of the on the bus got very quiet when we were approaching the smoke. A massive wall of smoke and flame sweeps toward the bus, putting its passengers in grave danger. I was sitting back about three seats behind the driver, this is Charlie, and I said, that's a lot of smoke ahead of us. And he said, shut up. He said, no, we don't want a riot. Uh, just keep, get, keep your seat and we'll get there with the riot. The morning of January 13th, William Hunt leaves for work as usual. His brother-in-law, Ted Scott, remains on the farm with his wife, Maggie, and daughter, Margaret. Within a few hours, a fire blazes out of control near the Hunt farm. An evacuation party moves through the area, removing people from their homes. For some reason, Maggie and Margaret are overlooked. They were so busy picking up other people that they probably didn't realise that, you know, somebody hadn't gone down that road. So it was just something that they'd overlooked and we didn't really think the fire was as bad as it was. While the unsuspecting family goes about their day, a devastating fire moves ever closer to their farm, slowly cutting off all avenues of escape. Australia, January 13th, 1939. Hundreds of small fires burning throughout the bush join together to form a raging inferno that races across the forest. The north wind was very, very hot and fiery. And in the morning when we got up, it was very, the sun was like a ball of fire when it was rising because it was so smoky. We knew the fire, that there was fire in the area, but we just didn't realise that the fires were so close. With the situation worsening, William Hunt leaves work to check on his wife and daughter. My father came home at one o'clock that afternoon and he was devastated to find we were still there because everybody else had been evacuated and we were in a position where we couldn't get out. His worry was then, knowing how close the fires were, coming both ways, whether we were actually going to make the river, because that was our only protection. William leads his family to the nearby river, their only chance to survive the onrushing flames. We walked down to the river, which was about a mile and a half, uh, the wind was just so bad that it was sort of scorching you as you were going along. And I had already seen the house go up on the other side of the hill. We got in the river and we had this raging fire going over the top of us. All we had was wet towels to put over our heads. 
In Warburton, 100 kilometers northwest of the Hunt Farm, volunteer firefighter Des Morish and fire captain Max Sparks take the fire engine to check for approaching fires. I said we're up on the aqueduct with the, with the fire engine. And of course, when it came through, like a thousand tornadoes and one great roaring fire, the fire was that fierce that it had burnt all the oxygen and it raced to the tops of the trees to get more oxygen to burn. And by doing so, it must have created a great vacuum because it sucked the trees completely out of the earth. Cut off from Warburton by fire, Des Morish and Max Sparks are trapped. There was nothing we could do, nothing. So we cut the wire fences and drove our fire engine down through the golf links, across the river. Devouring flames are also threatening the bus where Jack Jones is one of 20 passengers. I could see that smoke work was coming down onto the beach, was going to be down there before we could get through. And also, back behind us, the fire had spread and was coming behind us. And Charlie, he drove in as close as he could get, and he said, righto, everybody out. And oh, by this time, the smoke was getting very nasty to breathe. Jack and the driver, Charlie, work quickly to get the passengers off the bus. They must reach the safety of the ocean ahead of a wall of advancing flames. All these ladies were standing in a group and Charlie said, get them moving if you've got to pull them. And we just literally dragged them through it and tell them to get out towards the water. The ocean provides safety from fire for Jack and the passengers of the bus. We walked out in the water to about our knees and the fire was, by that time, there was burning gum leaves and bits of this bush, and they was coming down thick and fast. So we had to go out to our waists in the water, and uh, you'd swing round if it got very, very hot. As flames threatened to envelop Warburton, Des Morish and Max Sparks return with the fire engine. And when we got down into the Warburton Township, there were calls for help everywhere. And our captain, Max Sparks, he said, this fire engine stays here to protect the township of Warburton. And with the fire racing through, setting fires ahead, three and four miles ahead, we had our work cut out going from place to place, putting these spot fires out so they wouldn't emerge into one big fire and take the township. Near the Robinson farm, a gathering inferno quickly engulfs the family home. When the fire struck the house, I lifted the baby, and as we tried to force the back door with flames over our heads, we felt death pass between us. Cold and remorseless, it struck our hearts with an icy chill. I shouted, run for your lives! Four of the Robinson children, Teresa, Mary, Vera, and Paul, listen to their mother and flee from the fire. John Robinson leads the rest of his family into the garden, their only refuge from the fire. The father grabbed uh, you know, what he could and we all got under a blanket. And I remember the other kids, you know, four brother and si sisters and brother running and, and he cried out to them to stop. I held the baby down to the earth and her eyes and ears were filled with dust and then she went unconscious. My shoes were burned off my feet and I never felt them. But what of our four lambs? Where were they? January 13th, 1939. A day that becomes known as Black Friday. Intense fires rage through the Australian bush leaving death and destruction in their path. The Hunt family waits out the fire in a river near their farm. The fire was raging over the top and it went straight across onto the other side. It was more than two or three hours and an eternity. 
you thought it was never going to finish. My dad decided to go home and see if our farm was all right or if the house was burnt down. Of course, the danger was that my uncle and him may not ever have got back. What William and his brother-in-law discover is one of the many small miracles of Black Friday. Although threatened by advancing flames, the family home remains untouched and intact. They lit another fire down below the house and when those two fires met, it just sort of turned around and went past the house. Along the southern tip of Victoria, Jack Jones and the rest of the bus passengers experience their own miracle, taking refuge from the blaze in the Indian Ocean. The, the flames jumped the, the main road with a swish, but it stopped almost immediately. When we came back, the bus, the fire had blistered all the paint on the top of the bus, but nothing else. The Robinsons have neither ocean nor river to protect them. Instead, they take a last stand against the fire in their garden. And Mum shielded me with her body to keep the heat from me, and I went unconscious, she told me. And the shoes, the soles of her shoes were burnt off her feet, and her clothes, and it all singed. My husband made me promise I would still stay where we were until Jack and he crawled up on their knees to the road. They called and called, and then he found them lying side by side, Paul and Mary and Vera and Teresa. No marks, just like they were asleep. Teresa, Mary, Vera and Paul succumbed to smoke and heat only a few hundred yards from the garden where the rest of their family survives. It was too terrible for my husband. He crawled back and I knew I would see them no more. My husband covered up the bodies of our darlings with an old burned coat we had. It was like a nightmare. The community of Warburton survives thanks to the efforts of the volunteer fire brigade. We stayed around Warburton putting out spot fires. When most of the heavy fire had burnt out and was just starting to subside and the wind had died down and the fires had gone farther away, we, we knew Warburton was pretty safe. Within days of Black Friday, the weather finally brings relief to the fire-battered country. What the Australian people lack in an organized search and rescue effort they make up for by pulling together as a community. Everybody sort of came together and helped one another after the fire, as best we could, till everybody was sort of back onto their own two feet. The Black Friday fires leave death and destruction in their wake. 71 people died on the 13th. Over a thousand homes were destroyed. The forestry industry was decimated. 69 or 70 sawmills in the forests were destroyed, which meant the livelihood of a large number of Australians were just wiped out. The Australian government immediately appoints a royal commission to investigate. The commission makes two strong recommendations the management of the forests had to improve to prevent fire in the future. And that led to the creation of what we came to know as the Forest Commission. The second recommendation was for the creation of the Country Fire Authority because at the end of the day, the huge manpower resource would come from the Country Fire Authority and the volunteers. Although the Forest Commission is soon created, the Country Fire Authority takes a few years and more tragedy to form. In 1944, fire again rips through the Western District and Central Gippsland, claiming 51 lives. This activated 
the government of the day and the Country Fire Authority was, um, was formed. And from that day on, the CFA as we know it has developed into a statewide, coordinated, very well funded, very well resourced firefighting facility. The horrible toll of the Black Friday fires remains the greatest of any Australian bushfire in recorded history. For the survivors, Black Friday leaves haunting memories they struggle with for the rest of their lives. People came and talked to us, but to talk about the fire was torture. I wanted to hide and die in the bush, and again I wanted to walk and walk with terrible thoughts we had. But faith in God slowly returned and brought with it a great peace. And we lived again, but life was different. And Christmas, as I said, was one of the worst times, like the saddest times we'd have. Because Mother couldn't see to celebrate. But I think with the strain of the fire and all, it took its toll on her. I don't feel so bad about them now because I think well, they're all together. Yes, made us more aware that we just couldn't uh, allow fires to be burning Every, anywhere and everywhere. Well, then, of course, they, they brought in laws then that um, you, on certain days you uh, weren't allowed to have any sort of a flame in the open air. Today we're better prepared for it, there's no doubt about that. We're better prepared for it. It's history, isn't it? And hopefully that history won't repeat itself. If ever there was anything worse happening to Victoria, could it be any worse than what it was that day? If you guys are preparing for the apocalypse or want to survive a disaster or just want to have a really awesome camping trip, check out the products we have in the links below. Just by shopping for these products, you help support Bad Day HQ. In fact, any shopping you do in Amazon while going through these links will actually help us produce more great content for you guys.